Well, thank you all for being with us for our third day of Values Emphasis Week activities here at Northwood University. We're, we've been blessed to have some extraordinary speakers and guests, and we earlier this evening honored seven extraordinary alumni that have, have done great things in their career and very consistent with the Northwood idea, uh, have not only been professionally successful, but have chosen to give back in their communities. And our guest speaker tonight is someone who just never stops giving back. He is truly the Energizer Bunny. He travels the world helping all of us to understand what it is to be an entrepreneur and what a difference oh, you can make in life and in the world. He's a successful entrepreneur, obviously. He's a proven CEO. He's a worldwide motivational speaker. He's an author. He's a Hollywood film producer. He's even a Grammy Award winner, and he told me over dinner he may soon be an NFL franchise uh, owner. He's been the founder of multiple startups in his career and the CEO of both public and privately held businesses. Companies like Priceline.com or Ubid.com or ColorJar and so many more. He serves on the boards of companies literally all over the globe and certainly here in the United States but also in Europe, in South America, in Africa and in Asia. And he supports entrepreneurs and small businesses in more than 150 different countries. He serves on the board of the Global Entrepreneurship uh, Week organization and is leaving shortly to go overseas uh, for their big annual conference. He supports economic growth and public policy initiatives um, that entrepreneurship can enhance by working with the White House, working with the State Department, working with the United Nations uh, on a variety of different projects that keep in the forefront those that are willing to put something at risk and to take a chance on a business activity that will help society. He's a frequent keynote speaker and he's been invited to speak, as mentioned earlier, in over 50 different countries around the globe on the topics of innovation, entrepreneurship, and business leadership. So we're extremely pleased and humbled to, to have Jeff Hoffman with us this evening. And if you would give him a very warm Northwood welcome, Mr. Jeff Hoffman. That was the thing Dale told me not to do. I don't really like stages, so I'm going to stand here with you guys. And that stage, I think, should be reserved for our honorees who earned it. So I will stay down here. I really enjoyed the uh, ceremony, especially because you students get to see this, but we got chocolate cake at the end of it. I saw this uh, sign the other day that said, money won't buy you happiness, but it will buy cake, and that's pretty close. Um, that was true tonight. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> I am thrilled to be here. As a funny coincidence. Um, I've heard about Northwood so many times, and uh, uh, you know, uh, actually the two Justins have been talking to me about coming here to visit. And by, you talk about small world, by sheer coincidence, I was in the middle of a business transaction, mentoring actually, mentoring some youth. And the guy that I was doing the mentoring with, we got on the phone, and I said, I had to talk to you today because I can't talk to you tomorrow, today. I said, because I'll be uh, in Michigan. He said, where? I said, I'm going to Northwood for the day. And he said, yeah, you might see my name on the building there. I was talking to Dick DeVos yesterday <laughs> without knowing that he was from Northwood. And I said, you know Northwood? That's when he said, yeah, you might even see my name on the building there. Talk about a small world, but you talk about a great endorsement, right? Uh, what we were just talking about is, uh, you know, he wouldn't put his name on anything he didn't believe in. So that was kind of a cool send off for me to talk to him before I came here. So our topic today is entrepreneurship. Um, and, you know, I started with this picture because entrepreneurship wasn't a thing when I was your age in school. Uh, it wasn't recognized, it was sort of frowned upon. When I would tell people, they said, what do you do? And I would say, I'm an entrepreneur. And I remember the first guy said, oh, you're a hustler, huh? And I was like, well, you make that sound bad, right? I hustle, but I'm not a hustler, I do legal stuff. And they would wink and they'd say, ah, oh, you just can't get a job, can you? And I said, this is my job. I'm an entrepreneur on purpose. And people would say, we get it, you got fired, didn't you? And I was like, no, this is what I choose to do. It was not a recognized thing. One day I get a call uh, that's why I put that picture up. In fact, I was over today talking to the high school students at Dow. And I got a call from a high school. And they said, uh, Mr. Hoffman, could you come speak at Career Day? 
And I remember looking at the phone and saying, yeah, you uh, got the wrong number. And they're like, no, we called you. I said, no, 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 I'm an entrepreneur. Your definition of career, when I was in, high, in school, career day was doctors and lawyers and nurses and stuff. I was saying earlier, one day we had an astronaut, and that was really cool. An actual astronaut came to our school. But I was like, I don't have your version of a career. And they said, well, we're starting to think maybe you do this on purpose. <laughs> and they said, so why don't you come to school and explain a career in entrepreneurship? Uh, and that's really what I want to talk about it. But I want to tell you, I'm sure there are people in this room, especially students who have heard this. This is what I heard my whole life. What's wrong with you? Why can't you just get a job like everybody else? And my whole life, I said, I have a job. Now, I would have never used the word entrepreneur, right? I really still don't. If you ask me what I did for a living, I'm a problem solver. What I want to do is find a problem in the world, fix it, and go find another one. That's my actual job. My business card would have said problem solver. But it's not typically the way we were raised. In fact, I'll tell you guys a funny story. I'm going to talk about my first company here. But one fall, my stepfather said, what are you doing at work? And I showed him. That was October. In December, a Fortune 500 company said, your stuff is really cool. We'd like to buy your company. So I said, cool. I sold the company. In January, I started a new one. In February, my stepfather again said, show me how that thing you're working on is going. And I showed him, and he said, wait, this is something completely different than you showed me a couple months ago. I said, yeah, I sold the company and started another one. He said, ooh, that's not good. I said, why is that not good? And he said, this is going to look really bad on your resume. <laughs> he said, uh, you look unstable. I said, wait a minute, people keep buying the companies I start? And he said, yeah, you're job hopping. I said, I'm building stuff and selling it. He said, not good on a resume. That's the world we sort of grew up in. Uh, and now you guys have, and this is why I'm here, you have something amazing, right? Not only is Northwood itself all about business, but entrepreneurship is strong. The understanding here of what this means, the classes you teach, uh, you guys understand entrepreneurship. And I came here because I fundamentally support that. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, very quickly, my background, though, I'm actually an engineer. I'm a software engineer by trade. That's the degree I got. Um, I worked for a little bit in corporate America. Now, I want to be really clear about something tonight. There's no right or wrong in anything we're talking about, right? No matter what, what I didn't have a long career in one company, that's not right or wrong. You should do what you want. What we're talking about tonight is DNA. And so I'm here specifically to represent the DNA of entrepreneurs. For me, the corporate job didn't work. I tried it for a little while. I would say it was a messy divorce. They didn't like me probably any more than I like them. In fact, I learned a valuable lesson. It turns out, I guess someday they'll do my autopsy and they'll discover that my DNA was like 90% sarcasm. And it turns out, for some reason, corporate America fails to value that the way I did. Sarcasm did not work well. So I left. I did it just for a couple years with my software degree, and I quit. And I've been building companies uh, really ever since then. That's the biggest one I've been involved in. Uh, but I'm going to tell you some stories of how we got there. Uh, but, you know, part of the reason to illustrate that is just to show you that anything is possible. Um, that company uh, was started on a folding table, literally like these with a small group of people. This company today does business in 200 countries. Uh, and I almost feel silly saying this, it's worth $93 billion today. In fact, I was in a little country of Slovenia, and I said that, and the prime minister was there. And he went like that, and I said, what? And he said, that's twice the gross domestic product of our entire country. And I said, I apologize for that. Um, creating value in the world actually is a good thing. Uh, creating jobs in the world is a good thing, as long as you're doing all that by holding a certain standard of your values, of your integrity, of your beliefs, the way you run your business, it's a win-win all the way around. So I've spent my life doing startups. We had some miserable failures, eight companies total. We had some successes. We went from things that crashed and burned to, uh, we, I've had a couple of companies that became multi-billion dollar companies. But I will tell you guys, and especially hearing your honorees tonight and your focus here on service and giving back, um, that's the way I was raised too. Which by the way, I live in the Midwest for a reason. I live in the red Midwest because of Midwest values. I never lived a day in my life in Silicon Valley, even though we built the sixth largest internet company in the world. In fact, 19 of the top 20 tech internet companies were all in California. We're the one that wasn't. Um, you don't have to live in Silicon Valley to do anything, right? Innovation is alive and well right here. In fact, I live in the Cleveland area, and I was uh, asked to brief Congress, members of Congress, on American competitiveness and innovation. And it was a cool moment because I went, you've seen it on TV, that big room where people are briefing Congress. I stood up and I said, 
innovation is alive and well. And then I paused it and I said, in Cleveland, <laughs> which I love saying on behalf of the whole Midwest. Uh, the, the, some of the greatest minds and talent are already in this room, right? You don't need anything that you don't have right here in Midland uh, to do anything that you want to do. And not only do I fundamentally believe that, but we sort of lived that ourselves. So my commitment was, after receiving sort of way more blessings than I ever deserved, I said, I want to give back in a way. And my way of giving back, I'm going to tell you guys the punchline of kind of this whole talk. Uh, entrepreneurship, somebody said to me once, man, your life's like this adventure. And I was thinking kind of in TV terms. If my life was an adventure, then the end of the little video would say this adventure brought to you by entrepreneurship. Because the fact that I chose that as my career path created the life that I wanted to live. Gave me the opportunity to literally design the life that I wanted to live. That's what entrepreneurs get to do, <clears throat> right? I don't tell people it's a job. I tell them it's a privilege. My friends say, I got to go to work. I say, really? Because I get to go to work. I love what I do every single day. And I design my own future by building the kind of company I want to work in. And by create, getting into the industries I want to be in. That's the opportunity of entrepreneurs. Instead of waiting for the future, just create it. That's what we do for a living. So since I was blessed enough to get to live that life, I made my commitment to giving back. And I <clears throat> said, what I want to do is teach other people how to go live the life they want to live, how to create their fulfilled life by using the only thing I really know how to do, right? What I know how to do is one thing, take ideas and turn them into something. That skill set happens to be entrepreneurship. The, the taking something from an idea phase until it's real in the world and it creates value and it operates and it creates jobs and makes money for that's what that's worth. So I thought, I will go out. Well, here's what I'll tell you guys what I really did. And, and I had one more internet company in 2011. Uh, we had a company called ubid.com. Uh, it was the fifth largest internet auction site in the world. We took it public. Uh, I was a Wall Street uh, CEO of a public company again, but it lost its meaning. Um, and so we uh, were able to sell the company. In, in 2012, I said, look, I'm sort of done building companies, and I need to focus on my commitment to giving back. Uh, you know, it was the old... Uh, to who much is given, much is expected. And I was like, I know I got these blessings for a reason. I know I'm supposed to go do something. So in 2012, I decided to take a year off. And my year was going to be giving back. And for one year, I said, I'm going to mentor people and teach them how to design their future so they can create the life that they want to live. And I did an experiment I didn't tell anybody. So for 2012, here's what I said. For one year, I am going to say yes to anybody that asks me for help anywhere for a year. I'm just going to say yes to anybody for a whole year. That'll be my giving back. I won't do any business. I won't make a dollar. I won't go to my office. For one year, I'll go wherever you guys ask me to go for a year. That was my secret for 2012. But let me tell you what happened. The second call I got was an email. And it was a young man in West Africa. And he said, Dear Mr. Hoffman, things are tough in the villages. Could you help? I'll eventually we'll learn and not go over there. Um, I think that sound is like one of those dog collars you're trying to train me. Is that it, Dale? Because it's working slowly. Um, you know, more cake would have been better because I would have stayed near that. Um, so I get on a plane. That's my commitment is yes, my year of yes. So I get on a plane and I go to West Africa and I sat down with him and I discovered something amazing. The skill set of entrepreneurship is the skill set of change. Entrepreneurs are the people that see the world the way it is, envision the way it should be, and pick up tools and start building that. So when I went to West Africa and met this young kid, I was like, wow, if everybody in this room helped one person, mentored one person and taught them the skills of entrepreneurship, imagine what we could accomplish. So I said, I'm gonna take that one year and I'm gonna turn it into a world tour and try to stop by each continent. I will tell you where I am on that. Um, that was 2012. And I just finished year five of my 12-month commitment. So I've been, thank you, I've been on a five-year world tour of mentorship. Um, along the way, I want to show the students something that we did. Uh, and again, this is the joy of being an entrepreneur, designing the things you want to go do. We had a fundamental premise, and I'm going to be really honest with you guys tonight. The, uh, uh, I had heard some people talking about your generation. And somebody said, oh, they're lazy and entitled. And I said, I don't know who you're talking to because that's not the young people I met. I met young people that are inspired and have values and want to change the world, right? And I am being Midwestern and being a an engineer, I'm a practical person. Most of the time, 
when people are talking too long, I start thinking, you know, you could have built a prototype and tested this thing in the time it took you to explain it to me, right? So I'm a let's just do it and see how it goes person. I've always been that. So we decided instead of trying to tell the world that you guys are here to change the world, that you're not lazy, you're not entitled, you're in fact inspired and ready to go, just show me where, we decided to prove our point. So we had this crazy idea. Our crazy idea was, let's chart a ship and sail it around the world filled with you guys, filled with millennials and entrepreneurs. Let's show them the world's problem and let's just see what they do. This is part of a, of a nonprofit uh, that I'm part of that we built called the Unreasonable Group. And the reason it's called that is because there was a famous quote by George Bernard Shaw, the playwright. And this is what he said, I'll paraphrase it. He said, a reasonable person adapts themselves to the world around them. An unreasonable person expects the whole world to adapt to them. Therefore, all human progress is dependent upon unreasonable people. So our thing was, and especially for students, but anyone in this room, if no one's ever told you you're crazy, you're probably not pushing hard enough. Right? At some point, people would say like, man, Paul, that guy's crazy. Did you hear his ideas? If you don't hear that, you're not trying hard enough. So you got two choices when the world tells you you're crazy. You can conform and stop being crazy, or you can just go find all the other crazy people. So I'll tell you what we decided to do. Let's just build a home for all the crazy people who think they can change the world and make sure that they can. And so that's what unreasonable is. So our idea was, let's take a bunch of inspired young people Take them out and show them the world's problems and see what they do. So we did it. That's actually the ship. That's actually us. We charted a ship. It was a crazy, unreasonable idea, and it worked. We charted a ship, and we loaded it with students from all over the world, and we took off, and we sailed around the planet Earth. It took, a, there should be a sticker that says countries are larger than they appear on the globe. Um, it took 98 days to sail the world. We circumnavigated Earth. We stopped in countries all over. The fifth deck of that ship, it's a research ship. The fifth deck of that ship is a lab. On that lab, you could create companies and products and solve the world's problems and launch startups. You could be entrepreneurs. What we did was we stood back and we said, let's just see what they do. We'll show them problems and we'll see how they mix together. It's funny because I remember the first day turning to Daniel, who's our CEO of that organization, the guy whose idea it was. And I said, man, I hope this isn't Lord of the Flies because um, we let them do their thing. Um, it was amazing. Uh, as we sailed around the world, Companies were started, problems were solved. I may mention some of those later if we have time. I'm telling you that now because we'll probably sail again next summer. So if people in the room, my email address will be on the last slide. If people in the room, students want to sail with us, you have to give up your entire summer. Um, you have to stay on the ship for the summer. Uh, you should let me know. And if uh, anyone else in the room, we have mentors on the ship throughout the whole summer. You can fly on for a week or two weeks, come join us for a little bit and go home. Um, it's an amazing life-changing experiment. I'll tell you more about it later. Uh, one last thing that was kind of cool though, in terms of dreaming big and then standing there saying, how did this happen? We were sailing off the coast of Africa and we got near Cape Town and the media got a hold of this story. We got this call that, hey, there's a guy in South Africa that would lo loves what you're doing and would love to mentor our youth with you. And we picked him up in Cape Town. And one night I'm sitting on the top deck, I would do fireside chats at night. You guys would all lay in blankets. I'd sit in a chair and we'd talk about life, your parents, your relationships, whatever you want to talk about, whatever's on your mind. And I look over and the guy in the chair next to me on the deck of the ship is the Nobel Peace Prize winner, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And he's like, this is cool, can I go? Um, that never would have happened if we didn't believe this thing was possible. So uh, you can talk about that more later. Let's talk about entrepreneurship. And now we call that obviously the entrepreneurship that you just saw. Um, uh, when I talk about, I don't like the word entrepreneurship anymore, but I'm going to tell you guys why. Because the U.S. messed it up, right? It made it, it, re, it made it too closely tied with tech. And think about why. If I were, I ask people now, you want to be an entrepreneur? And they say, not really. And I say, why not? And they say, I don't know how to build apps. And I was like, wait, who said anything about apps? And they're like, well, I don't have an idea for a website. And I have to say, who said anything about websites? You know why they think that? Name, if I asked you to name three famous entrepreneurs in the U.S., Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill, they're all tech. Because unfortunately, our media has decided to glorify tech. And it really does a disservice because we need people in automotive, we need people in agriculture, we need people in manufacturing. Entrepreneurship has nothing to do with internet companies and it has nothing to do with money. So I want students that are thinking about entrepreneurship to be really clear. It's a mindset. Entrepreneurship is a mindset and it's a way of thinking and solving problems. Entrepreneurship is the mindset and the tool set of saying, 
this thing could be better in the world, now I'm going to be the one to fix it. That's all it is, no matter what field you're in. I, I just went to a, a fashion entrepreneurship event where people that wanted to redesign, be the future of the fashion industry, they wouldn't have thought of themselves as entrepreneurs. But if I asked them if they want to be the future of fashion, all these entrepreneurs said, yeah. Um, that's what it's about. It's about attacking problems with a mindset and a way of problem solving. And you know why it's a cool job? Because what I just told you, you get everyone else, you know, here's your choices. I'll wait and see what the future brings or I'll just design it, right? That's the way that I went. Entrepreneurs are the ones that get to do that. They are designing the world everybody else is living in uh, with their unreasonable ideas. I'll tell you my first foray. Um, I grew up in a small desert town in Arizona um, where I grew up, Again, it's not my place to ever judge anybody, but no one I grew up with wanted to leave. They didn't want to do anything. They're, uh, in fact, unfortunately, I'm flying from you guys at five in the morning to the funeral of one of my childhood best friends, uh, but they're all still in Arizona and nobody left. And I was like, it's cool for you guys, but I got dreams. I got stuff I want to do and I couldn't do it there. And so I knew that the root of everything was education. And it's kind of ironic now, by the way, I picked this university because there was this cool new thing that was going to change the world back then called artificial intelligence. It took a little while to get here. And I was like, I want to learn that. And there was only a couple universities that had it. That was one. So I worked really hard to get in. That was my big dream. I'm going to get a degree from Yale, so I'm going to get in somehow so I could study uh, artificial intelligence. And like Kelly told you, it's all on you. It doesn't matter what university you go to. You don't have to go to, and, and in the sense that no matter what university you go to, if you do nothing with the knowledge you gained and the skills and the relationships, it doesn't matter anyway, right? So I wasn't going there because it was Ivy League. I was going there because there was something I wanted to learn and they taught it. Um, so I work really hard. I get into Yale. I go there. Uh, first day of class, I'm in class. They're like, is there a Jeff Hoffman in the class? I was like, here. And the professor said, yeah, you need to leave. And I said, why? And he said, you didn't pay. In front of all these mostly rich kids. By the way, the door's over there and I brilliantly sat here. Right? And I said, pardon me. And he said, you didn't pay. You can't go to class. And I said, I come from a family with no money. We're poor. We sent you everything we have plus aid. And he said, it's not enough. You'll need to leave. And I had to walk past all those laughing students and walk out of class. Go to my second class. The guy picks up the sheet of paper. I can already see a giant red line through one name. So I ain't making that mistake again. I just left. And I, I went to the financial office, right? The treasurer's office. And I said, what's up? And he said, you can't go here. You didn't pay enough. Right? And that's fair to the school. I did not pay the full amount because they didn't have it. And he said, what were you even thinking? And I said, I worked so hard to get in. This is my dream. He said, well, I guess that's over. Um, so I went and called my parents. And I said, my big dream's over. And you know what they said? Ah, just come home. So then I started calling my friends. I said, hey, my big dream. I worked so hard to get in. They kicked me out. And they're like, ah, just come home. So I put the phone down. And I went and sat outside in the stairs. And I thought this. I'm 18 years old. This is the first big obstacle I've had in my life and everybody's advice is to quit. Just come home. And I started to realize something. The truth is, if you have big dreams, this is a sad reality. It's not for everybody. But a lot of people want to see you fail. You know why? Because then they don't have to try. If you don't achieve it, they can shrug it off and say, see, big dreams aren't worth it. They don't work out. And so I said, you know what? I'm not going home. I sat on the steps and I said, I'm not leaving here until I have that diploma. I will walk that stage somehow. So I started my first company on day two. Uh, I had nothing else to do, and I was trying to solve a problem. My first company actually was a software company, which would have been fine, except I don't know how to write software because they won't let me go to class, so I can't learn anything. But I just created a software company anyway, and I had nothing to do that during the day. So I wrote literally unsolicited proposals to develop software for local businesses. And the crazy part was one of them called and said, cool, cool idea, build it. And I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> I don't have a company. I don't know what I'm doing. I made up stationery right in the basement of my dorm and sent it out and someone bought it. So I made signs. I had no car. I walked to all the schools in the area and I hung up signs programmers wanted. And I brought a bunch of people who'd never met and I sat them at a table and I put down the spec. And I said, can you guys build this? And they passed it around and they're like, yeah, he'll do the database. He'll do the interface. I'll do this code. I was like, wait, you guys can build this? They said, sure. I said, you're all hired. I said, what do you want? You know what they wanted mostly? Pizza money. You know what business pays you? Real money. You know what my margins were? Enough to fund the college tuition. I ran this company for four years, and at the end of four years, I walked the stage and graduated and got my Yale diploma. When I walked, thank you. When I walked, by the way, unlike some of your faculty who was really supportive, 
there was some of the, the faculty of my university standing at graduation when I was walking. You walk the yard at our school. And I said, wait, what? Did my check not clear? Are you not giving me this diploma? And he said, no. He said, we just came to see if you were really here. He said, we had a betting pool and everyone bet against you. I said, thank you so much for your support. And he said, we just can't believe you got this diploma. When I left, I did not say, this is the important lesson. I want to be an entrepreneur. And I did not say this was about money, even though that's what I needed. What I said was, there's a direct relationship between your commitment and your desire to achieve something big, right? You can solve. I thought, man, that's the unsolvable problem. Not one person anywhere thought I would get that degree. And I funded that education myself. And I walked away thinking, you know what, world? Bring it on. You got another problem? Let me try it again. Because maybe work ethic right, and focus can actually solve problems. Maybe you shouldn't quit at the first sign of trouble. Maybe you should bear down harder and say there's got to be a way to solve this problem. So when I left, I made a relationship between the planning skills. By the way, what did I have to do? I had to start a company, hire people, write budgets, write proposals, communicate, pay the bills. You know what that is, coincidentally? All the skills you need to be an entrepreneur. The skill set of entrepreneurship was the tool set for me to achieve what I want. Today, I tell people the skill set of entrepreneurship is the skill set of self-determination. That's what I'd rather call it, because that's what it's about. I wanted that degree, and I found a way to get it by developing a skill set that you are learning right here at Northwood that enabled me to do that. Now, I want to talk about attitude. I want to tell you guys a story, because I fundamentally believe this. Sometimes, whatever your life's goals are, especially all the students here, whatever your dreams are, your attitude determines your outcome. So I'm 10 years old. I go to my neighbor's house, we're all little boys, and all my buddies are at Mike's house, and they're all gathered in his room, and they're all excited about some poster. And I was like, what is that about? Now, the poster was a Ferrari. By the way, I'm not a car guy. I did not know what a Ferrari was. They had to keep, like, say it three times so I could pronounce it. That is, now, I'll be honest with you, that's not the actual poster. The actual poster was a Ferrari with a blonde in a bikini sitting on the hood. But we were 10, and I remember one of my friends saying, that is so gross, that girl's bare butt is touching that fine car, she needs to leave, right? So we were like, ooh, that's gross, she's sitting on the car. So I go home and I say to my mom, what is the fascination? My mom said, with what? And I said, this poster, all my friends are fascinated. She said, what was it? I said, it's a Ferrari. And she said, oh, well, that explains it. And I said, what? And she said, it's, the fascination is it's unattainable. It's just a dream. I said, oh, my bad, I thought those were real. My mom said, no, no, Ferrari's a real car. And she said this, just you, neither you nor anyone you know from our little poor town will ever drive one. And I said, wait, 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 what do you mean? Like, why not, right? And my mom said, son, it's like a million dollar car. She said, no one you know, including yourself, will ever drive that car, so quit worrying about it. They're fascinated because it's an unattainable dream. And I said, wait a minute. I said, mom, does someone drive that car? My mom said, yeah, someone, someone has that car. And I said, well, wait, why can't that be me? And she said, now, to be fair to my mom, she was trying to protect me, in her words, from unrealistic expectations. She said, son, you will never drive a car like that, nor will anyone you ever know, so quit worrying about it. And I kept saying, but wait, if someone does whatever it takes to drive... Oh, no, guys, this isn't a car story. I'm not a car guy. I don't care. I didn't even want the car. I wanted people to stop telling me no. So I went to school the next day. I said, when I grow up, I'm going to buy a Ferrari. I tested it. Everybody laughed. I said, why is that funny? Like, dude you're never going to drive that car. Have you ever even seen one in this town or anywhere around? No. And they said, never going to happen. And I remember thinking, not with that attitude, it's not. Everybody I know accepted the fact that none of us will ever have that car. And I started thinking this that I want you to think about. Why do you let the rest of the world put a ceiling on you? Why do you let anybody tell you what you're capable of achieving? And I started thinking, if there's some path, even if it's one in a million, from where I am to driving that car, I'm going to find it and I'm going to figure it out. And I didn't want the car, I just wanted to prove that it could be done, and that the attitude of letting the world, I'm especially talking to the students, don't let anyone else tell you what you're capable of, and don't let anyone else talk you down from a big dream, because it's already over. If you think you can't, you can't, okay? So I'll tell you what I did. I went to the mall, I got on my bike, I actually rode down the street making Ferrari noises all the whole time, because by now I'd looked it up. Um, and I went to the mall and I bought the poster. And I came home and I put the poster on my wall, but I did something. On the back of the poster as a kid, I wrote down a list of things. And I said, if this list of things proves true over my life, 
when I cross off the last one, I will buy that car. I don't even want the car. I just want to prove it can be done. By the way, I'll give you an example. One of them was somebody said, you'll never succeed in business. And I said, why not? And he said, because you're too nice. You've got to be a jerk. And I said, what? And he said, have you ever heard that expression, nice guys finish last? I was like, yeah. He said, where do you think it came from? From reality. I said, I'm not buying that. So you know one of the things I wrote? I wrote that, that I do not fundamentally believe that I have to be a jerk to succeed in business. In fact, I believe the opposite. By always doing the right thing and treating all human beings with the same level of dignity and respect, I should be more successful, not le less successful. That was one of the things I wrote down. So I made a list of 10 things that as each of one, if I could prove them in my life on the 10th time, whatever year that was, I'm going to go buy this car just to prove it can be done. I do have to tell you a funny story, though. I, uh, in high school, I was getting ready for football practice, and I ran to get something out of my closet. And I was reaching up, and something fell down, and I unrolled, and it was this poster. And I was looking at the poster again. And my mom came in and said, you're going to be late for football. Let's go. And she looked over. She saw what I was looking at, and she said, oh, I see you found that car again. And I was looking, and I was looking. I said, wait a minute, what car? And I was 18, just turning. My mom said, so you finally found the girl, didn't you? And I said, geez, why didn't you show me this before? And my mom said, son? And I said, yeah, mom. And she said, you ain't getting one of those either. <laughs> I said, geez, thanks, mom. And I said, mom? She said, what? I said, one more question. And I said, just suppose I drove that car. My mom said, fine, that girl would probably show up. Um, just a funny, like, the way life works thing. It was never a story about cars. It was a story about attitude. And so I want to tell you, do not let anybody tell you what you're capable of or what you're not, because all the people that believe it's not possible, it's not possible for them. Um, I started with the attitude that I think I actually can pursue big dreams. And if I didn't have that attitude, I would have gone home when my college dream fell apart. So here's what I want you to do. And by the way, when I talk to adults, when I talk, when I scale down younger, I speak in a lot of schools, and I ask younger kids, what do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to be? Everyone has an answer. What are your dreams? What are you going to do with your life? Everyone has an answer. Um, when I start to go up the scale, as people get older, they roll their eyes. And I was like, what? And they're like, dreams. I, when I was young, I had dreams. Now I have a husband, a wife, a mortgage, and kids, or whatever it is. And they say, Jeff, you've got to grow up. And I always say, you know what, guys? Is that growing up or is that giving up? Why are you accepting that as you get older, because you have to pay your bills, you can't have dreams and goals anymore? And so part of the reason is people don't want to be reminded anymore. So I'm going to tell you what I do that I would challenge you to do. I write down my dreams where I can see them. And I'll tell you literally where I put mine. I take these little white index cards and I write things that I want to do in my life so that when I look back, I will be able to say, I spent my time on this earth well. I use this precious gift of life wisely. And so I write those down and I stick those cards on my bathroom mirror. And I'll tell you why, uh, for two reasons. One, I put them in writing because you can't hide from them anymore. I want you guys to write down some things you want to do and stick them somewhere. You know why it's on my bathroom mirror? Where do I end every day? At the end of every day, I brush, I'm in my bathroom brushing my teeth. I look at that thing in the mirror and I say to myself, what did you do today to get any closer to the life you said you were going to live? And where do I start every morning? In the bathroom brushing my teeth. And I ask this question, what are you going to do today? to get any closer to life you said you're going to live. And you know what else is good about the bathroom mirror? You've got to look yourself in the eyes, and it's really hard to lie when you're looking in your own eyes and saying, am I really doing this or not? Here was my first one. I grew up in this little desert town that had nothing. On summer days, we would literally sit there and say, what do you want to do today? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? We'd do that like until dark, then we'd go home. And I was like, man, I've got to do something. I want to see the world. One day in class, we had to read a Mark Twain book. And I opened up the Mark Twain book, and there was a quote inside. And the quote said, travel is the fatal enemy of prejudice. And even though I was in seventh grade, it stunned me. And I was like, you know what? How do people hate people they've never met? Why do we have this in the world? How are you hating someone? How are you even using that word? You don't even know those people. And Twain's point was, why don't you go explore the world and meet people that aren't like you and understand them first? And I thought, if I'm ever going to be the man or the person I want to be, I need to do what Mark Twain said. I need to go break bread with families that don't look like me, right? And have a meal with them and listen to their stories. And maybe then I'll be a good human being if I develop understanding, but I can't do it sitting here. I got to leave my community. So I wrote that down. I said, for me to live the life I want to live, before I die, I need to visit 50 countries in my life. That was my goal. But I'll tell you what happened. My parents 
said what your parents and your parents and your parents said. They said, son, go get a good degree at a good school so you can get a good job at a good company and get a good paycheck. So you know what I did? I got that engineering degree not because I laid in bed as a child dreaming of engineering stuff, right? I dreamed of far off lands. But I got an engineering degree because my parents said you can get a good job in engineering. So I got a good job at a good company after college. I went and got an engineer, and I'm not saying anything yet good or bad about this. I'm just telling you one person's story. I got a good job at a good company. I had a good salary. But you know what? I did not have a good life. Right? I've done some commencement speeches at college graduations, and I asked the parents, do you want a perfect kid or do you want a happy kid? Because what you're trying to create is a perfect kid, and you're not even asking them if it makes them happy. It makes you happy what you're telling the kid to do. What makes them happy? I did what my parents wanted. I had a great job at a great company, and they told everybody, they bragged about their son, but I was miserable. Okay? And every day I would sit in this office, and I would look at the clock and just wait to go home. I'm going to tell you what happened one day. One day, I was in the... Uh, ooh, too soon. I was in the uh, elevator, it was lunchtime, and I was like, couldn't wait to get out of the building because I hated my job. I get in the elevator, and there's a guy I know, and I was a friend of mine. I was like, Brian, what are you doing here? And he's like, Jeff, what are you doing here? I said, dude, I work here. And I said, what are you doing here? He said, I work here. And I was like, wait, how is this a good friend of mine? We work in the same, this is a huge engineering company, and I've never seen you. I said, where do you work? He said, I'm in marketing, and I work on the sixth floor. I said, that explains it. He said, why? I said, I'm in engineering. Engineering's on four. So I come in and go to four every day. He's up on six. That's why I never saw him before. So I go home that day, and I'm brushing my teeth, and I'm looking at that, and a thought occurred to me for real. I literally dropped my toothbrush in the sink. I said, how am I going to visit 50 countries in my life? I have never even visited the sixth floor. Okay. <laughs> One day, I accidentally pushed five with one of my engineering buddies. We got off the wrong floor. I was like, what country is this? And he said, they call it accounting, and they don't speak our language. Run. Okay? <laughs> so we're like running through accounting, laughing, and I hear these like practically alarms. Engineer in accounting. Engineer. And I was like, run, man. That was the farthest land I've ever been to. And I literally said to myself, I'm never going to visit 50 countries. I've never even visited the sixth floor. I quit my job. I quit then, and I said, I have got to design the life that I said to live. That's why I want you to write that down and quit hiding from it. Put it somewhere you see it. Ask yourself regularly, am I doing anything in my life to ever make that happen? It doesn't matter what yours is. It's yours. That was mine. So I quit, and I went to start my first company, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. I'm going to mention it. But remember, my goal was to see 50 countries. So it, before I die, and I was never leaving my cubicle. So I quit and I started a company. I'll tell you about it in a few minutes. But my first company was a travel company, right? And guess what happened? One day, I'll show you the product later. But I get a phone call. And it's, I said, may I help you? And they said, yeah, this is KLM Royal Dutch Airlines. Uh, and, and I was telling the high school kids, I, I must have slept through sixth grade geography. Because I was like, Dutch. I know it's not Germany. They're Deutsch, right? And I was like, is it Denmark? No, that's Danish. And the guy's like, we're from the Netherlands. And I was like, yeah, sure, I knew that. Right? And he actually said, could you come to uh, Amsterdam to show us your travel product? And I remember, I can remember saying, I, I had just started this company, I was 20 something years old and broke. And I said, man, I can't afford an airline ticket to Europe. And the guy's like, yeah, KLM Royal Dutch Airlines, we actually own the plane, you can come with us. And I was like, that's cool. And I said, I can't afford a hotel in Europe. And he said, we own half the hotels in Amsterdam. And I was like, this is getting better all the time. So I fly over there. My friends are like, where are you going to be this weekend? You coming to watch the game? I said, no, check this out. I'll be in Amsterdam. And they said, how are you able to go to Amsterdam? And I said, this is the coolest thing ever. That's my job. I created a job in the travel industry where my job was to sell products to airlines. When I got there, by the way, they were like, have you ever been into the Netherlands? I said, with all due respect, I've never been to the sixth floor. And they're like, wait, what? And I said, never mind. <laughs> um, uh, and I said, no. And he said, would you mind? Check this out. He said, could we talk you into staying the weekend to give you a tour of Holland on us? I was like, yeah, I'll have to get back to you. Like, right, really? I actually said, is this some kind of prank show on camera? There's no way you're asking me that. After the weekend, I did product demos. They took me on those boats and the rivers. We saw the windmills, the tulips. This was country three on my 50 list, right? At the end, they're like, Mr. Hoffman, don't forget your check. I was like, wait, my check? And they're like, yeah, we want to buy your product. I was like, wait, you're paying me for this? That is the reality I created by using my entrepreneurial skills to create a job that enabled me to live the life that I wanted to live. Why was I successful? 
This is the key thing because I solved a problem for somebody I wanted to be around. Being an effective problem solver gives you the chance to live any life you want. Solve a problem in whatever industry you want to be in and you'll be the go-to girl or guy. You'll be the person everybody calls the way the airlines called me and said, what do we have to do to get you here? And then Lufthansa called and said, anyway, we could talk you into coming to Germany. And then it started all over the world because I solved a problem for them. That is the key. How do you become a successful problem solver? I already told you the punchline for this. You'd master a set of skills that are coincidentally called entrepreneurship. It is the set of skills of having an idea and turning it into a business, an actual fun functioning business. By the way, a lot of it is soft skills, right? I had an engineering degree, but I'll tell you what, nobody told me how to hire people. In fact, one of my first days, I hired three employees. An employee three came down the hall. He goes, yeah, Jeff, you better come down here. I said, what's going on? He said, the other two employees are arguing and I think they're gonna fight. I was like, what am I supposed to do? He said, I don't know, man, it's your company, it's your problem. I was like, I'm an engineer. He said, you better learn HR on the way down the hall. <laughs> I was like, I better learn psychology. Learning how to hire people, motivate people, manage people, creating accountability, listening, adapting. All these are the skills that as I got better at these things, I became a better entrepreneur. But if you can do this stuff, there's nothing you can't do in the world. You can create any company to take you anywhere you want to go by solving a problem for the industry that you want to be in. Entrepreneurship is not the goal, it's the tool. Don't say, I want to be an entrepreneur. Say, I'm going to make the automotive industry better by solving this problem. When you say that, entrepreneurship is just the tool set you need to do that. But focus entirely on the problem. With my very first product, I'm going to tell you something really quick. I didn't know this then, I wasn't smart enough. But looking back, I was building a product. And I'm, again, I'll show it to you in a few minutes. And uh, a friend of mine, I was obsessed with solving a problem in the airline industry. That's the company I was just talking about. And a friend of mine came in and he goes, hey, good news and bad news. I said, what's the good news? He said, I have a friend who's an investor and I told him what you were working on and he wants to give you some money to build it. I was like, cool, what's the, how could that be bad news? And he said, yeah, the bad news is he wrote you a check and you don't have a checking account. I was like, yeah, I'm an engineer. I don't really know money stuff. And I said, I don't have time to worry about this. I got to build this thing. And he said, I said, go get me a checking account. You're a finance guy. He said, yeah, I would, but there's more bad news. And I said, what? And he said, you don't even have a company. I was like, I have no idea how to create a company. I just want to solve this problem. Be solely obsessed on making something better in the world and everything else will follow. It's not about being an entrepreneur. It's about solving some problem in the world. But I just got to tell you guys, I was like, this formula actually kind of works, right? Pick a problem, a dream, start with a dream, something you've always wanted to do. Find a problem you can solve in that industry, become valuable to the people in that industry, and you can design your future. So I decided to test that. I love music. I was at a concert one day, and it was 30,000 people in this concert. And the guy, some guy comes out on stage, he's like, are you people ready to rock? And everybody's screaming, and he's like, let's light this place up. And everybody's screaming, and I turned to my friend, I was like, who's that guy? And she, he, she said, he's the concert producer. This is his show, he created this. And I was thinking, how cool is that? Because you know what the power of music is? The universal language? For that night, every person in that arena, by the way, it was an Elton John concert. Every person knew every word to every song. And you know what happened in that room that night? 30,000 people that had no differences. There was no race, there was no ethnicity, there was no age and there was no gender. Everyone in that room was standing together, might as well have been holding hands, singing Elton John songs and forgetting all their problems. I was like, I want to do that for people. I want to be the producer of the concert. Um, later, by the way, I saw a tour and they, a band was saying, well, we're off to see the country. We're going on the tour bus. I was like, I want to go on the tour bus. Okay. But when I said I was going to start a music company, my friend said, dude, you're a software engineer. You don't know anything about music. And here's the other thing I want you to understand. No matter what degree you get here or got, you are not an accountant. You are not an engineer. You are not a lawyer. You are a person that learned accounting. You are a person that learned, I'm Jeff, I know software engineering. But an engineer, they don't actually stamp it on you, okay? It's just a thing you learn. So when I said, I'm gonna do music, everyone said, you're a software engineer. You don't know anything about music. I said, the same way I learned software, I could probably go learn music that way. Never stop learning and never one ever, everyone convince you that once you've picked a career and that's your degree here, that's your career. That's just the thing you're gonna do as long as you enjoy it. If you enjoy it, you, the rest of your life, you should do it. But if you wanna learn something new, you can make a change. 
Every person I told I was going to start a music company said, not a chance, you're an engineer. You're a software guy, you don't know music. So I'm going to tell you the formula. Well, I'll tell you what, just really quickly. We talked about attitude. And one day, I, was, my, I came home and my sister was a Saturday. My sister, I was in high school and my sister was in college. And all her friends were all excited over all these photos. And I said, what are you guys all excited about? And they said, last night we went to the Elton John concert. And I was like, you guys seem pretty fired up. Did you hang with him? And they're like, no, we were sitting in like the nosebleeds. We, he was like way down there. We never saw him. I said, what are you so excited about? They said, our favorite artist. We got to sit live and hear Elton John. And I thought that's that power of music. But I told you I have this problem. There's no 12-step program for sarcasm or I'd be in it. And I turned to my sister. And as I was walking away, I said to her and her friends, I said, you know what? Someday when Elton John and I are friends, I'll tell him you like his music. And they all started laughing. I remember whipping around and said, why is that funny? And my sister said what most people's attitude is. She said, in a million alternate lifetimes, you're never going to be friends with Elton John. So I started walking back to my room. And again, I was thinking, not with that attitude. But I started thinking, you know what? Here's the problem. I'm some little kid in a little tiny desert town, and that's a worldwide superstar. How am I going to be friends with him? And the answer is, accept that things are improbable, but never say the word impossible, right? And I started thinking that. And what I want you to realize is that if you are, have a big dream, and you are looking at it from where you are, when you look upwards at a big dream, it's like a giant mountain, and it looks really steep and it looks impossible to climb. It's too high, it's too long, it's too hot out, it's slippery, there's rocks, there's cactuses. When you look up from where you are towards your big dream, it seems impossible. So I came up with a technique. I already told you what this is, right? The technique is pick a dream, an industry you wanna be in, study that industry, find problems you can solve to become valuable. So I'm gonna tell you one of the things that I did. I want especially the students to pay attention to that formula. I studied the music industry right, because I've already done software, and I researched the concert business, and I googled concert production, producing concerts. I even found out there's a magazine called Polestar, never heard of it in my life, none of you would have. It's the magazine of concerts, and only concert producers get it. It was like 12 bucks, so I subscribed. And in that magazine were articles written by the country's top producers, and their email addresses. So I started emailing them, and 49 out of 50 won't answer. But one guy said, sure, what can I tell you? I said, tell me everything I need to know about producing concerts. When I was done, I made a list. So whatever industry you want to be in, make a list of all the problems they have to solve. I wrote it down. And I wrote down, someone has to write songs, not me. Someone has to sing songs, not me. Someone has to dance, totally not me, okay? But you know what else I wrote down? When I started talking to people in the music biz, they're like, man, we're artists. We don't know how to put financing deals together. I said, wait, I do that every day. I finance my products, right? And then the big one, was when I talked to artists, they said the reason most of us don't do concerts is because we're not marketers, we're just musicians. We don't know how to market and promote and create an audience and create a product and price it and sell it. I was like, wait, I do that every day with my products. So I crossed off all the things in the industry you want to be in that you can't do. If there's nothing left, move on. But circle something you can do. And I said, I'm going to go study marketing and promotions because that's the problem everyone says we're not good at that. I studied a part of the music industry to launch it. But I want to share another part with you. <clears throat> when you are looking at, even so, I'm standing there saying, OK, I'm this kid in the middle of nowhere, and I'm going to somehow start being on the concerts, and I'm going to be friends with Elton John. Right? Here's what I want you to do. Plan your goals backwards. Don't stand and say, how am I ever going to get on that stage with Elton John? Project yourself at the end of your journey. So this is what I did. I took out a blank sheet of paper. I took out a pen. And I said, OK, I'm friends with Elton John. And then I said, what would I have to do the day before that? He would have to like me. And the day before that, he would have to hang out with me. And the day before that, he would have to invite me to hang out with him. And the day before that, we'd have to meet. <clears throat> and the day before that, someone would have to introduce us. And the day before that, I would have to know somebody who knows Elton John. And the day before that, I'd have to know someone in the music that knows the person that knows Elton John music business. And the day before that, I'd have to have any reason why someone in the music industry would take my call. And the day before that, I would have to have some valuable skill that someone in the music industry wanted so they would take my call. You see where I'm going? When I drew the whole plan backwards, I looked down and I said, wow, there is actually a path. If you project your goals backwards all the way to you, where would you have to, what would you have to done the day before and the day before when I was done? I said, it might be one in a million, but it's not zero. I projected a path which had enabled me, 
when I was like, wait a minute, this is that moment, I can learn that skill, and then when I call her, she'll say, yeah, I need help with that, and she'll introduce me to him, and he'll say, hey, I'm going over to his office, you wanna go? I could see the path, and I just wanna show you a day, this picture is old, but <clears throat> this was a day that I was doing a charity concert, Elton and I were doing charity concerts together, and I was backstage with my friend Elton John, it was kind of a funny moment, because my sister called, <clears throat> and I said, I said, hey, I gotta call you back, I'm doing a concert. And she's like, you're at a concert? I said, well, I'm doing a concert. And she's like, what are you doing really? And I said, I'm doing a concert. And she said, seriously. I said, Elton and I are about to go on stage, I gotta introduce him, I'll call you later. And she's like, who are you with? And I said, Elton John, was, she said, yeah, right, in a million years, right? I handed him the phone, and he's like, says hello, and excuse my, well, I won't, I'll, you won't use her choice of words. She said, give my brother the phone back, you jerk. And my, he's like, oh, your sister doesn't like me. And she said, tell your little friend his British accent isn't even a real British accent, right? So I took that picture because I'd have forgotten that until that moment. And I thought, you know what? If I had accepted impossible, I would never be standing there at that moment. When I went out on stage, Elton said, are you going to introduce me or not? I walked out on stage. It was like an out-of-body experience. I was like, I looked up. There's 30,000 people. I said, you people ready to rock? And I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm actually standing here saying that. How on earth? What am I doing here? Right? I was in that moment, I could hear myself, and I'm like, I'm on stage. In fact, we'd become friends. I said, I couldn't find a good band available tonight, so a British friend of mine is going to come out and play the piano. Right? And I said, wait, I'm making fun of Elton John on a stage in front of 30,000 people? The reality is, I left the door open for the dream, I planned the goal backwards, I never lost sight of the vision, and my set of entrepreneurial skills enabled me to create that moment, to create a company that put me in the music business. I told you then I wanted to do tours. So after the concert thing, and I, will be, I, I won't bore you with the details, but we launched a tour company. This picture is embarrassing, I'm gonna admit it now. But this is when we were uh, on tour with NSYNC. Um, and that's me there, Justin Timberlake standing next to me. Uh, he has a hat on because back then he was doing cornrows and they were wet. Um, and we were, we were all hanging out backstage. But there was a moment, right, where I was, I studied the concert industry because my dream was to be on a tour bus someday with the band. Right? I can't play in the band, but if I could become valuable to them by solving a problem, I did what I told you guys. I studied the industry, I wrote down all the problems, I asked where they needed help, I got educated in that problem, and I launched a company solving the problem of producing tours. And it, one day, we were in Heinz Stadium where the Steelers play. NSYNC was the biggest band in the entire world right then in total sales. That was at the height of their success. The stadium, 70,000 seat NFL football stadium, sold out two nights in a row. Pittsburgh. The place was rocking. I thought the stadium was going to collapse because NSYNC was so big then. And I remember turning backstage with the guys were getting ready to come out, turning to Justin Timberlake and saying, man, did you ever in your wildest dreams imagine you'd be standing right here, right now, 70,000 screaming fans, everybody in the world wanted to be right there. And Justin Timberlake said, hey, Jeff. And I said, what? And he said, did you? And it really <laughs> struck me because I looked around and I was the one guy standing there with them. And I was like, wait, what am I doing here now? Right? I'm on tour with the boys, we're in a 70,000 seat stadium and they're about to go on stage. You're, you own your future. You have the ability to design it by developing this skill set. I'll just close on the music part that a couple of years ago I won a Grammy for an album we produced. And I was standing on the red carpet thinking, whoa, what am I doing here? And some of the, uh, in this picture, I'm getting yelled at because I don't know if you can see, but I'm taking pictures of all the paparazzi that were taking my picture. <laughs> And they're yelling, you can't take pictures here. And I said, apparently I can, because I'm taking them right now. They're all screaming at me. But somebody in the crowd yelled, how does this feel? And, and, I, and I said this earlier to the high school students. I said, this is the dream of software engineers everywhere. And they're like, what? The little guy with the headset, he like whispered in my ear, you're killing the vibe, get off the red carpet or shut up. And I was like, never mind. The point is, you are whatever you design yourself to be. As long as you are a good learner, there's no dream you can't create, and there's no life you can't live. I never dreamed of winning a Grammy. That wasn't on my bathroom mirror. But if you'd asked me then if I thought it was ever possible, I never would have said no. Anything is possible with your skill set. So I was like, that went pretty well. Um, before I die, and I don't forget what mine are, music or film. What are yours? What are the things you want to do with, what, with, with the rest of your life? So you'll look back and say, man, was this a great ride. By the way, I, I, I mentioned earlier and I saw some of the high school students tweeted that. My new definition of success. When we are, we are raised to believe that success is a combination of one of three things. Wealth, money, power, and fame. 
When someone's rich, we say they're successful. Yet I have billionaire friends who are miserable, so maybe that's not it. When someone's famous, we say they're successful because they achieved fame. I have some very famous fan, friends who are miserable, so maybe that's not it. And yet I have some friends who don't have money, fame, or power and are happy every time I see them. So I started thinking, why, what is that? What is the definition of success? I'm going to tell you my new definition. Success, a successful human being, is any person you meet that can stop right now, whatever age they are, look back at their life with all their mistakes and say, man, what a ride. I wouldn't trade my life with anybody. Okay, stop trying to wishing you had somebody else's life and make yours the one you look back and nod and say, I wouldn't trade with anybody. All the mistakes included. That's the person you should be jealous of. They might have money. They might have fame. That's not the point. The point is anyone that loves their life exactly how it is now and doesn't want you to change it, that is the only definition of success that matters. So when I started noticing those people, I noticed that those were the people that stopped hiding from their dreams. They wrote them on the mirror and they found a way to live that life. So I had another one. Some people want to climb Mount Everest. I said, before I die, I want to make a movie. I love the creative process. It'll probably be a failure, but I just want to do it and go through it. And by the way, don't fear failure, fear apathy, okay? Fear the indecision to ever do anything. The biggest shame is not failing. The shame in life is in not trying. So don't fear failure, fear apathy. I don't have a problem with failing because if I try something and fail, I can get up and say, well, movies weren't it. It's not meant to be. But if you never try, Every time you see a movie the rest of your life, you're going to say, I wonder if that could have been me. I wonder what I could have been. And that will eat you up from the inside out. So try things, fail, shake it off and try again because you can live with failure. You can't live with never giving it a shot. So I said, what the heck? Let's try this thing. So you know the formula. I studied the movie business. I tried to figure out where I could be valuable in this thing. We launched a film company. By the way, all my friends said, Jeff, do you know that 97% of all independently produced films will never be in a theater near you? They, and I said, yeah, I heard that before. And they said, you're still going to make one? And I said, yes. And they're like, what part of 97% are you failing to hear? And I'll tell you, because this is attitude determines outcome. And this is the DNA of entrepreneurship. You know what I remember thinking that day? Can you get me the phone numbers of those other three people? Because apparently three people know how to do this, and I thought it was only one. I was like excited about 97% not discouraged about it. Entrepreneurs look for the three ways to do it, not the 97 reasons it can't be done. That's what they do. It doesn't mean you're going to succeed. It means you gave yourself a chance when everybody else already gave up. Anyway, we started this company. We made our first film. This is, oh, uh, that's the first movie. It's a scary movie. It's on Netflix now and everything. Um, we made this film. By the way, they like to kill me in every movie. That's a little thing. So I'm dying from a bleeding wound down there in that picture. Um, my partner in the film business, in the scary movie business, is a guy named Eli Roth. That's him directing me. Um, Eli and I had never made a movie before, but I studied the business. I found out where I can help financing and distribution. I can't act. I can't operate a camera. I still don't really know what a best boy is, but it's something on the movie set. Um, or, a, or a gaffer or a grip, all these things. But I can do some part of this business. So we created the company, just for the heck of it, this movie, I'm not a money-driven person, but we made this movie for $1.2 million. That's like startup money, it's not Hollywood money. Uh, but I know how to market stuff, that's my thing. And so we marketed it, we sold it in 46 countries, and it made about $98 million on a million dollar movie. My friend said, how'd your little movie do? And you know what I said? It was fine. I actually felt bad telling people that it worked, so I just never said anything. We learned the business and we attacked it. I'll end this part and then I'm just going to close with some tips for being a successful entrepreneur. This is what I'm doing now. Um, sports is also a passion of mine. I love being around athletes and I started studying the sports industry. Here at Northwood, you are learning how to learn. When I was doing a commencement speech I, with, with, with a big university, I said, congratulations, graduates, your education's finally over. And they cheered. And I said, just kidding, it starts tomorrow. Okay, all you're doing here is getting ready to learn. You're learning how to learn. When you leave here, <clears throat> that's when you start learning. You, we are teaching you the skills of how to learn. So I apply that to learn new things. So I said, I want to learn sports. I studied the business side of sports because I love sports and I wanted to be around athletes. And I'll just uh, sort of cut to the chase. Last year, that's uh, my friend Derek Jeter. He played for the Yankees for 18 years. Five World Series. Last year, I was sitting there one day uh, because my phone was ringing. This is a crazy thing. My phone was ringing. And so I said, who is it? My friend said, it's Derek Jeter. And I said, I'll just call him back later. He's calling me too much. 
And then I stopped and I said, wait, did I actually say that? You know what we were doing? We put together the deal to buy the Miami Marlins. So I'm sitting there and I'm saying, Derek, why are you calling me? And he said, because I don't know how to buy a team and you know how to do that. There's a problem I need solved. It's the business side of sports. You're the go-to guy. What I want you to be is the go-to girl or the go-to guy in whatever industry you want to be in, in automotive, in fashion, in manufacturing, in tech. Learn to solve problems so you are the go-to person for the industry you want to be in. That is the path. Um, that's Charles Barkley. We started. Charles helped me really understand the inside out of uh, football. And this is my current partner. That's Ray Lewis. He's a Hall of Fame linebacker. He played for Baltimore. Ray and I just two weeks ago announced the launch of our newest company. We created a brand new company to buy professional sports teams. And right now we're in the process of buying an NFL team. But if you ask me if I would have dreamed this as a kid, no. I never thought I was going to own an NFL team. But if you ask me if there was a path to it, I just told it to you. Be a good learner. Set high goals. Study an industry. Solve a problem. And become valuable to the people that you want to call you. I was telling my high schoolers earlier today, uh, before I move into this last part, um, recently I was out in LA and I got a phone call that kind of blew me away. I found myself uh, sitting at, because uh, it was Christina Aguilera. And I was sitting at Christina Aguilera's house and she's making me dinner and I'm like, I'm a huge fan. And I said, what am I doing here? She said, I quit The Voice, I quit touring, I got a business idea, I want to be an entrepreneur now, and everyone says you're the go-to person. So she called. When I was driving back from her place, I mentioned this earlier today too, I got another call, uh, which was Pitbull. And he's like, when are you going to be in Miami? I was like, why are you even calling me? He said, I got an idea, and everyone says you're the guy that knows how to implement this thing. Can you come by and visit me? Your path to being anywhere you want to be is being a problem solver that solves problems that the people you want to be around. Again, I don't care. Mine were sports because that's what I care about. Whatever yours is, if it's fashion, that's what you want to do. So I want to end with a few examples, a few things. This is the first one. Solve a real problem in the world. You know what most people do when they see a problem? They come home from work. You're, you have an errand to run at work, right? And you have an hour. And you stand there and it takes three hours. And when you get home, people say, how was your day, dear? You say, horrible, those idiots made me stand in line for three hours. This should have taken an hour. You change your Facebook status to irritated or whatever, right? People complain about problems, but you know what most people do? Then they go back to their life. They just go back to work and say, those people are idiots. Entrepreneurs do something everyone else doesn't. When they see a problem, I'm going to tell you, Next time you find yourself complaining about a problem in the world, stop and ask this question. Does this bother a lot of people? And if the answer is yes, don't leave. Stop and ask this question. Is there a way to fix this that no one's thought of yet? Do the research. And if the answer to that is yes, entrepreneurs do a third thing that everyone else doesn't. They say, you guys can go home because I ain't leaving until I fix this. Next time you see a problem in the world, ask, is it a big problem and can I solve it? So here's mine. I told you I quit my engineering job. I was 20-something years old. I am unemployed. My parents are now calling everyone to tell them that somehow they spawned an idiot because their son had a good job and a good paycheck, and he quit. I just walked out because I couldn't take it anymore. And my mom's like calling me and saying, Can you, do you need groceries? And honestly, I was kind of hungry, and I had no money and no job, but I wasn't going to say yes. I was like, man, I bet. But I'll tell you something. There is a value to discomfort. When you quit your safe, comfy job, I get up in the morning and I said, I better think of something creative fast or I ain't going to eat. I like the pressure, right? All of a sudden, I have to create in the world. That was cool. Comfortable doesn't lead to innovative nearly as easy. I'll never say it doesn't, but you're a lot more innovative when your life depends on it. So I was standing in an airport line. I bought an airline ticket. Remember, I was unemployed. Everyone's mad at me. I bought an airline ticket to go talk to a friend of mine, a mentor. And the line was one hour long. Uh, it was Delta for the record, um, and it took forever, and I missed the flight. And that's an expensive problem, especially when you're unemployed and 20-something years old, the price of that ticket. So I get to the front, and the woman's like, next. And I give her my ID, and she hits one button, print, and hands me a boarding pass. I said, you got to be kidding me. I stood here for an hour, and you hit print. She said, sir, you have to have a boarding pass to get on a plane. I said, ma'am, with all due respect, I get that. But I stood here for an hour so you could use the printer. It's a sheet of paper, a boarding pass. And, and she said, sir, you have to have a boarding pass to get through security. I said, ma'am, that's not the point. There's 100 people in line and one person hitting print on a printer. I said, it makes no sense. Put a printer over there. And she said, sir, only an airline can print a boarding pass. Next. And she was kind of irritated. So I turned to the people behind me. When you see a problem in the world, ask a question. I said to all these people, 
in the airport, I said, am I the only one that thinks it's insane we're standing in line for an hour for the printer? Everybody groaned, right? I was like, okay, I'm on to something. By the way, in entrepreneurship classes, we teach market research. I just did groan research, and that was pretty good. How loud was the groan? Loud, this is a business. Okay, but there's one more thing you need to have for a business, a value equation. A value equation is simply this. Will people, enough people in the world, pay you more than it costs you to deliver your idea? If the answer is no, by the way, congratulations, you have a hobby, okay? Hobbies are things we spend our money on. A business is things other people pay you to do. So I turned to the people in line. I said, well, anybody in this line, I yelled, anybody in this line give me five bucks if I could give you a boarding pass now and you could get out of line. You know what happened? They started bidding. Five dollars, ten dollars, fifteen. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't really have these, right? Some dude in an Armani suit at the back of the line said, I will give you twenty dollars right now. My time is worth money. Get me out of this line. I said, now I got a business, right? And I remember thinking, you guys wait here. I'll be back. That Friday, I started my first company. But remember, I told you, my dream was to see the world. So I was trying to think, could I start a business where my job was to visit airports in the world? And that's the moment I said, this is the intersection between my dreams and being a grown-up, because I do need to pay my bills. My parents were right. I need to be responsible. I need to someday raise a family and take care of things. So what I'm telling you is, don't separate your dreams from your job. A job is not a thing you have to have. And if there's any time left over on the weekend and you're not too tired, you'll go do something you want to do. Why don't you design them both? I want to see the world. I got to get a job. That is the moment. I started my company Friday. If you've ever gone to an airport anywhere in the world and checked yourself in in a kiosk, we invented those. Uh, that was my first product. We designed these, we built them, we patented them. <clears throat> Thank you. You know, it's funny. Sometimes I'll just be walking along and my phone will buzz and it's someone in an airport, someone in the world, take a picture of themselves getting a boarding pass and it just says thanks on the bottom because uh, they grabbed it going through. You know what happened? Why did KLM call me? Why did I get to go to see air kiss countries all over the world? Because every country wanted us to solve the problem. Every airport in the world wanted these things. I got to go see the world because I solved a problem for the industry I wanted. They let me do what I wanted. Now I told you guys, I'm not a money person. I've never been owned by it in any way, shape, or form. But I just want to tell you what happens when you solve problems for industries. Um, I, three years later, I started the company, and three years later, we sold the company for over $100 million. Um, it's not internet money, but I was 20-something years old and unemployed, and somebody comes along and says, man, we'd give you $100 million bucks for what you just built. And I was like, you can go ahead and do that if you want. Um, it's kind of funny because my mom called shortly thereafter. And she's like, that's when my stepfather was telling me my resume was going to have weaknesses in it because I only worked at that company for three years. Um, my mom called and said, can you buy groceries? And my friend was standing next to me, and I remember he yelled, he can buy a grocery store. I was like, shut up, man. <laughs> that's not what this is about. It was never about money. It was about finding a way to design my future. This is probably the most important thing I can teach you all night. Don't chase money. Chase excellence. Money follows excellence. Why am I telling you that? Everybody I've ever met who was obsessed with money and getting rich never got there. They were so distracted by money that they never created anything. What I want you to do with your lives is go do something amazing and you will never worry about money again. Every single time I've created something, we were heads down focused on excellence and every time someone rang the doorbell and bought the company again. With people today, and I know we teach this, we teach exit strategy, but you know what I think? When people say, what's your exit strategy? I say, what is your entrance strategy? What are you exiting? You're going to sell your PowerPoint for $100 million? You haven't built anything. Focus on excellence in your life. Create amazing, and the world will pay you whether you want it or not. If you don't create something amazing, no one's going to pay you anyway. And if you do, you'll never have to ask. That is the most important thing I've ever learned. Focus on excellence while everyone else is focusing on money. And my friends kept saying, how come Jeff always gets paid? He doesn't even care about money. That's exactly the reason why. I care about excellence. I care about problem solving. I care about looking back at an industry, walking through an airport, whatever your industry is, and saying, you know why those lines are shorter? Because I was in this industry and I did something. Focus on excellence and you will never worry about anything else. Just a couple more points before we quit here. This is an important one. Win a gold medal at one thing. Let me tell you why I'm going to tell you that. People, entrepreneurs come up to me all the time and they're like, man, I got six ideas. And I always say, okay, get rid of five of them and pick one and do it. And they're like, well, someone will steal my other five ideas. Here's the truth. Doing one six of six things is not hedging your bet. It's guaranteeing you're going to lose. You cannot achieve excellence at six things. Excellence, by the way, the reason I use a gold medal 
Uh, well, I guess Hope Solo is no longer on the team. Maybe I should change the picture. Um, but the reason I chose her is, if you're, if you're this girl that wins a gold medal in soccer, this is not what your day looks like. You do not come home, play soccer for 10 minutes, then shoot hoop, hit the softball, swim, watch TV, read a book, eat a sandwich, go outside and play badminton. You play soccer every day of your life since you were six years old. Winning a gold medal at anything requires focus on that one thing. So pick the thing in life you think you can most likely win a gold medal in and stop doing everything else. It's a discipline problem. If you don't believe me, I'm going to give you examples. Early on in the internet, we all talked because we all knew each other. I would talk to these two guys, Jeff and Pierre. They had this little auction idea that didn't make a lot of sense to me, but it turned out it was eBay. Um, I kept telling them, I don't, I don't get it. And they kept saying, uh, uh, you know, here's that, what we're going to build. I used to talk to this other guy named Jeff. His company's called Amazon, the other Jeff. Um, and one of the things, if you look at Amazon today and you say, what do they sell today? They're the mar they sell everything. They're the marketplace of everything. But here's the part you might have missed. For seven years, Jeff Bezos sold nothing but books. You know what he said? I'm going to be the best darn bookseller on the planet. You know what you and I said because he focused on excellence? Man, it was only the book, but that's the most excellent internet company I've ever dealt with. Sell me something else. If you are excellent and win a gold medal at something, the world will say, wait, you build Amazon, build me this. I'll give you another example. Seven years he had the discipline to do nothing but win a gold medal in books. I have another friend named Tony Shea. This is Tony's company. Tony, when Tony created Zappos, you know what he told me? He said, I'm going to be the best darn shoe seller on the planet. Today they sell women's clothing and accessories. But you know why? Because he won a gold medal in shoes. And women said, what an amazing company. Can I get some earrings and a handbag to go with those shoes? <clears throat> win a gold medal <clears throat> at something. Be the best darn something you can possibly be in the world. When my friends Jeff say to me, Jeff, you've done all these different things, here's the lesson, never at the same time. When we were building travel, if you came up to me and said, hey, check out this idea, I would have said to you, if this won't get butts in beds and hotel rooms, call me next year. When I was doing music, we did nothing else. If you called me then and said, I have a travel idea, I would have said, if you don't have an idea to get more, all the seats at our concert filled Friday night, call me next year. Do one thing at a time in your life and do it with gold medal ability. And if you can't win a gold medal, stop and do something else. But focus on one thing at a time until you can win a gold medal. At, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that part. Um, I kind of want to end with this. If we have time, because I don't know, I'm trying to be respectful of your time for the evening, I can go back to that piece. That was a learning technique I use uh, for innovation and for idea harvesting, we'll call that but I'm worried about it. I've gone over my time. Um, I, I'm going to say this again. It all starts here uh, at learning how to learn. I already made that point that be a good learner. One time a kid said to me uh, in math, right? He's like, why do I need to know math? He said, have you ever done math again? I said, to be honest, even though they taught me how to compute a square root of number in school, no car company, no car has ever pulled into our corporate parking lot, walked into their offices, taken out a credit card and said, how much for a square root of a number? No one's ever actually asked me to compute one again, even though I learned that in school. So kids say to me, why do I have to learn all this stuff? Why do I have to go to college, right? And I'll tell you why. Because it's not the stuff, it's the technique, right? You know how I learned the music industry and the sports industry and the movie industry? Because my history class taught me how to do research. We had to write research papers, and I'm a good researcher. You know how I sold my ideas to people like Derek Jeter? Because my English class taught me how to write and communicate. I'm a good communicator. Do you know what, how I was able to solve difficult problems? Because my math class taught me analytical thinking and how to deconstruct problems, right? One of my other teachers in an engineering class taught me critical thinking. My marketing class taught me how to identify my target audience. You are learning how to learn. So it's not what you learn, it's the techniques that Northwood is teaching you so that you can do what I did. When you get out of here, I was confident attacking any industry because I know how to learn new stuff. That's what you're here for and do it. Before I close, build a great team. The reason I'm telling you that is no great story ever. In fact, if any of you were watching the Oscars, I thought Allison Janney said something funny. Everybody stood up and read a list of 40 thank yous. And she jokingly stood up and said, I did it all myself, good night. That was a joke because no one ever did it all themselves, right? That's a good visual example. They have a list of 40 people to thank, even though they were the actress in the role or whatever, it was the director. That is true of everything. No great anything in the world was ever built by one person. It's about a team. And when your professors and faculty and business people in this room tell you network, 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 
they're right. Everywhere you go, if you leave this room tonight, if you're at this table and you don't say hello to anybody at this table, you blew it. You missed a chance. These are people that could change your life, that could mentor you, that might invest in you. Everywhere you go, network and meet people. All the people at all these tables should say hello to each other on the way out because you might have just missed your first investor, your mentor, your co-founder, or you might have missed literally your future husband or wife because you didn't even say hello. You can't do it without a team and you can't build a team until you create your network. The worst time to create your network is when you need one. The time to create your network is now. Every one of those companies I built, the day I started, I already knew all the people I wanted to call because I'd already met them before and I'd kept track and kept in touch with all of them. Build networks and manage relationships. Sometimes you pick up the phone and you call Kelly and you say, I'm gonna be in LA, can I buy you lunch? And you have no agenda. And you just buy lunch because you're maintaining relationships. Because one day you'll call and say, can you help me with something? And he's gonna say, yeah, what can I help you with? Because you needed the knowledge he has that you didn't have. Build your network. This is the last one. This is one I'm gonna close with. And it's all about work ethic. Uh, and I use sports analogies because they're good analogies of life. But I wanna tell you a story. Uh, if you're not a boxing fan, this is my friend Evander Holyfield. Evander, in that picture, not that I'm proud or anything, that's when he knocked out Mike Tyson. If you don't know this, you know what happened in the rematch. Mike Tyson bit my friend's ear off. Um, and so Evander was training for a fight in Vegas, and I was at his house. Uh, by the way, I'm not a material person, but we're standing in front of his house here. What you can't see is that his house is 59,000 square feet. Um, there's something to be said for hard work, okay? And not that he ever dreamed of anything like that. One day he said, what do I do with all this money I made from being successful? I said, you live in a state that has a homestead law, build a house. I didn't mean 60,000 square feet of house. It has 110 rooms. That isn't the point. The point of the story is about hard work. So Evander's training for a fight. And I want to share this life lesson with you guys. And I'm spotting him. And he's doing an exercise that he does 300 times every day. It's insane. There's no reason to do this 300 times a day. A normal human being, he lays on a bench like this with his whole lower body from his waist down on the bench and his entire upper body suspended in midair. He takes a giant weight behind his head and he goes all the way down to the ground and back 300 times a day. I was like, Are you, this is ridiculous. A normal human being, if you did it twice, you would snap in half and I'd have to get two stretchers to carry both halves of you out. So I think it's insane, but he does it. So I'm counting for him. He's got fighting for the World Heavyweight Championship and we're getting ready. And I'm spotting. And I'm counting, <clears throat> and I said, uh, 299, 300. And Evander stops with all the sweat and all those muscles rippling. And he says, Jeff, and I said, what? And he said, 299 or 300? I said, 300. And he says, Jeff, and I said, what? And he said, was it 299 or 300? I said, dude, it was 300. And without taking his eyes off me, he goes all the way down to the floor again, and he says, I think it was only 299. And when he came back up, I did this mistake. I rolled my eyes, like, are you kidding me? right? And Evander sat up straight and he said, look at me. Now I remember thinking, well, that was a short life. <laughs> this was not the guy to get into a fight with. But he said something that changed my life and this is not a sports story. This is what I want you to take into everything you do in your life. He turned and he looked at me and we sort of locked eyes and he said this. He said, the difference between 299 and 300 is the difference between heavyweight champion of the world and every other boxer. And I gotta tell you what happened, man, I had goosebumps. He walked out in dead silence and I closed my eyes and I stood perfectly still for 10 minutes because I wanted to make sure that literally soaked into my soul. And I will tell you why. Because as soon as 299 is good enough, what's good the next day? On Thursday, 298, that's almost 299. And what's good the next day? 297 is pretty close to 298. And you know what's happening down the street? He's doing 300 and he is going to beat you in anything at life. So you know what I did? I went home. And I wrote on my, wall, on my board, I took out a, a piece of whiteboard, and I wrote the number 299, and I put a red circle and a slash through it. No 299s. It's on my wall. By the way, I love it when people will contact me in LinkedIn or email, and they'll send me a picture of a no 299 in their bedroom, or their house, or their fridge, just saying, yeah, I get it. Here's what happened. I'm in business, not sports. I'm in my office one day. It's midnight. I'm writing a proposal, a big one. And I finish it. And I look at it and say, we will win this bid. We will beat all our competitors. This is a good proposal. I turn the lights off and I'm walking out and I'm walking under my own board where it says no 299s. And I stopped and I looked at it. And I want you to ask this with every job you do in the professional side, every student you teach and faculty and every paper you write as a student. I said, this is 299, it's good enough, but is it the best work I can do? 
right? Because that's the difference between the heavyweight champion of the world and every other fighter. And I looked at it and I said, this paper will probably get an A, but is it the best effort? This is the attitude of excellence, the attitude of winners. I said, it's not the best proposal I've ever written. You know what I did? I took my shoes off, I poured some coffee, and I stayed till 4.30 in the morning. When I was done, I said, this is 300. I cannot do better. This is the best I can do. And I turned it in. Two weeks later, the customer called. And she said, you won, hands down, best proposal we've ever received. And I've been here 20-something years. And she said, but I want to share one other thing with you. I said, what? She said, I did something I've never done in my entire career. I said, what? She said, I was in an industry conference sitting at a table with all my competitors, because that's what happens in an industry conference. She said, I can't believe I said this. But she said, I told everyone at the table, don't even waste your time with the proposal process. Just hire Jeff's company because no one else comes close. And you know what I got? Four more contracts that weren't even out for bid. Four companies called and said, can we just transfer to you guys? I got five contracts out of that one contract. That is the difference between 299 and 300. There is nothing worth having in this life that anyone's going to hand you, or that you're ever going to get easy. But if you are willing to outwork everybody around you, and I heard a couple people say that. I think that might have been Kelly. Somebody on the stage said, you did. You said, you don't have to be an Ivy Leaguer. You just got to work harder than them. You were right. As long as you are willing to do 300 when the rest of the world's okay with 299, you will achieve excellence and you'll never have to worry again. If you guys want, I'd be happy to take questions. If you got to go, thank you very much for spending the time with us. Mic. Yes, we got a mic coming around. Did you buy the Ferrari? Um, <laughs> Yeah, again, I'm not a material guy. Uh, but when I finished the last thing, I went out just to close the loop. And people don't understand. They see you in a, it's, I bought a racing Ferrari. It's like metallic black on all black leather with bright red lipstick trim. Somebody came up and said, I don't know if this sounds weird, but your car is kind of sexy. It, it's, I bought the car only because I was going to close the loop and say from the day, you know a funny story? It's a race car and it's really loud. And a friend of mine got in one time, he wanted to ride. And he's like, oh my gosh, your car is so loud. And without thinking, I'll tell you my response. I said, it is, it drowns out the sound of no. And I remember when I said that, I was thinking, if I had listened to all the naysayers in the world, I'd never be hearing this sound. I don't even care about cars, I told you that. But every time I turn that key and I hear that race car light up, I think if I had believed everybody that told me to quit and that I wasn't good enough or smart enough, and if I hadn't worked 300 hard, I'd never hear that sound. So. Whatever yours is, doesn't have to be a car, but yeah, I bought the car. And I can't pretend it's not fun to drive, but I was perfectly happy without that car. Awesome. It's about innovation and creativity. Uh, the, the, I started studying the world's most creative people to try to figure out what they're doing that everybody else isn't. And I created a te technique to mimic that. Somebody said, man, you guys had so many companies that succeeded, you had a lot of good ideas. Well, it wasn't an accident. Yes. When people talk about innovation, they think it's an accident. I was in the shower and I got this idea. Innovation is a process, not an accident. And there's something that the world's most creative people do that, that gets them there. And I've been very blessed to have a lot of friends that have been creative people. Uh, from like, I just did a trip to the UK with Steve Wozniak. Wozniak and Jobs built Apple, right? Another friend of mine, Nolan, he's the creator of Atari. He invented video games. By the way, he also invented Chuck E. Cheese because his kids were annoying him one day. That is a true story. Um, <clears throat> another friend of mine, Mike's the creator of Instagram. I know the guy that started uh, um, YouTube. I've had friends who've been creative and created stuff. And so I started studying them, and I just want to share with you. This is a technique, I, the word's made up, I made that up, info sponging. But I'm going to tell you a technique that I created to try to make sure I always have another good idea coming. Because when you told me you had six ideas and I said let, said, let five go, somebody else did those other five. But you know what? You'll always have another idea, right? So here's what I do. This is what info sponging is. Every single day, and by the way, here's why. If you are in the automotive industry, what do you work on all day automotive stuff? Right? That's your business. You spend all day solving automotive problems. If I were to say to you, hey, I'm going to the banking conference. You want to go? You would say, Jeff, we're in auto. We're not in banking. Why would I go to the banking conference? If I were to give you a magazine called How to Run a Retail Mall, you would say, Jeff, what part of automotive are you missing? We don't run retail stores. And so therein lies the missed opportunity because what I noticed from the world's most successful people. Like I was with Richard Branson not that long ago. And we were laughing because, do you remember the movie Up? Do you remember the dog Doug? Every time he's in mid-sentence, he goes, squirrel. Every time a squirrel runs away by, he loses his train of thought. My friends say squirrel half the time to me. Because when something, any shiny object, I say, can you hang on a minute? I need to go see what the shiny object is. 
intellectual and natural curiosity drive you. So what I'm telling you is, for 95% of your day, do automotive. But what I'm telling you is take 5% of every day to look at the rest of the world. Okay, so my technique of info sponging, here's what you do. I do it every morning. For five minutes every day, 10 minutes. If you can't do this every day, do it once a week. For 10 minutes a day, here's the rule. You do not work in the automotive industry and you do not work for your company. For 10 minutes a day, I want you to leave. If you're, if you're in faculty, you're not in a faculty. You're not in higher ed and you don't work at Northwood. For 10 minutes a day, leave your world. And what you're going to do is you're going to do this. Every day, you're going to learn one new thing a day. This is what info sponging is. I take 10 minutes and every day I learn one new thing. Here's the lesson that you don't need to know and you have no idea why you're learning it. Okay, I read something. By the way, how do I decide what to read? I just follow my curiosity, right? And you know why? People always ask me, where should I look? Anything that catches your eye, trust your gut. And here's why I think that. Our gut instinct needs a new brand manager. It's poorly marketed. When you tell somebody you followed your gut instinct, they think you made an irrational decision without thinking about it. But the truth is, gut instinct should be rebranded and it should be called my fast intelligence. And you know why? Because your gut instinct is the sum total of every mistake you've ever made and everything you've ever done right. So when my gut says, turn left here, I should probably turn left because your gut is the sum total of every mistake you've ever made. So when something catches my eye I, and I was like, I wonder what that is, I never question it. I just read it. There's some reason my gut instinct told me to read that. Every day I read one new thing and I write down one sentence. What did I learn today? And here's the way I want you to think about it. If you think of every new thing you learn here in school, every new thing you learn as a puzzle piece. If I gave you one piece of a puzzle and I said, what is this? You would say, Jeff, I don't know. You gave me a blue puzzle piece. If I gave you two or three pieces, you wouldn't know. But if I gave you a puzzle piece every day, and every day you put them on your desk and you added the new one and you moved them around, one day he would pick up the phone and call me all excited. And he would say, oh my gosh, I just figured this out. He said, this is going to be a castle in Ireland. That's what you do with knowledge. That's what the world's most innovative people do. They constantly scan the whole world and say, did someone in a different industry come up with an idea that I could apply to my industry that no one else ever has? By the way, I'm talking to this guy, Travis, one day. And he's like, I'm looking at this thing called the sharing economy. And I know there's something there. That's one puzzle piece. And he said, I'm looking at the trend towards home-based biz home -based businesses. And I know that's a piece. Then he said, I'm looking at people's desire to try to make the economies down. People need to make a little more money. And he said, then, lastly, I'm looking at the transportation and taxi industry. You know what Travis did? He said, what if I took the creative economy, home-based businesses, micropayments, and taxis, and created the world's biggest taxi company that doesn't own a single car? That's how Travis created Uber. Not by looking at taxis, by looking at completely disjoint things. Right? So that's the way. By the way, I'll, I'll close with one example that happened in the Midwest of why you want to info sponge. You want to see what someone else was doing. This is a true story. It was a hamburger chain in the Midwest, and it was not growing. And the guy, the owner, told the manager, he said, innovate, do something creative. We're, not, we're the same as all the other burger chains, and we're not growing. So what most people do is they go inside their industry. Let's go see how to improve the automotive industry. He went inside, and he said, I can't make french fries any faster because you can't heat grease any hotter. I can't make fill Diet Cokes any faster because they splatter. He said, I don't know how to make my industry any better. But one of the other guys said, I'll see you guys. I'm taking the day off. They said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to visit banks. They're like, banks don't make cheeseburgers and they don't make fries, so you're wasting your time. Here's what happened, real story. He went to the first three banks. He didn't learn much. The fourth bank, when he got to it, he couldn't park because the parking lot was filled with pickup trucks. In the trucks were, were wood. Next to the wood were hammers and nails. And in the parking lot were a bunch of carpenters outside the bank. He said, what are you doing? And they said, oh, we came up with a cool new idea. We're building it. He said, what is it? They said, when it's finished, we're going to call it the drive through window. He got in his car, flew back to his burger joint, and said, I just saw the coolest thing in a bank. He built the first drive through window in fast food industri industry history, and it was not their idea. He stole the idea from a bank. You know what happened to his company? Ray Kroc saw it and said, wait, you can drive through? He bought this company and it turned into McDonald's because of the innovation of the drive through window, which came from going to see if another industry had a good idea you could steal. Make sense to everybody? So that's what info sponging is. It's the te technique that I use. Every day when I wake up, I wonder this. Did someone invent something while I was sleeping so that what can I do today that I couldn't do yesterday? You couldn't have built Uber 10 years ago. 
He couldn't have really even built Priceline at the time we came up with the concept of a, of a reverse auction for perishable commodities, right, that had to be dynamically priced in a shielded pricing channel. All these things that we were looking at came together and we said, holy crap, we could assemble them in a way no one ever has before. Our company with the reverse auction, the name your own price thing, again, became worth $93 billion. It never would have happened if you stared at the travel industry. So that makes sense to everybody? That's what info sponging is. I do this all the time. I go out and learn one new thing every day that I don't know why I'm learning. And some days I just shrug. And other days I wake up in the middle of the night and I was like, wow, that thing I was looking at today, suddenly I have an idea. Combine lots of other people's ideas in your brain and let them float around. That's info sponging. Thank you. Thank you. Anything, thanks. Anything else before we... Uh, any, any other questions? Otherwise we can call it a night. Yes. <clears throat> Yeah, you get discouraged all the time. Nothing works the way it's planned. In fact, I'll tell you one lesson I learned in boxing from boxing's greatest philosopher. One night, Mike Tyson, the great philosopher, said, he said, everybody has a plan just till you get punched in the face. Okay? Mike Tyson was right. Your plan is brilliant and it can't fail, and then life punches you in the face and you fall sideways and nothing went the way you planned it was going to be. Everybody goes through that. We had failures. You heard about the successes. We had miserable failures. You will have your discouraging moments. That is why the most important decisions you will ever make in your life, <clears throat> and that applies here at Northwood, and it was proven by the number of people who met their spouse here. Um, the most important decision you ever make is not what you do, it's who you surround yourself with. The people you choose in your life are far more important than the things you do. Ideas and companies will come and go, but if you have the right people around you, you can get through anything. So focus on the people you surround yourself with. So when I have a really bad day, I have a network of people who say, man, I felt like that Thursday and you were here for me. Somebody will lift you up that day when you are feeling really down and you will lift them up when they have it. It's about surrounding yourself with people that know you're going to have a bad day and there's going to be a day. The other day I said to a friend of mine, I said, don't talk to me today, I'm crabby. She said, I ain't even going to call you until tomorrow. But I just said, it's a bad day, just leave me alone. And she said, I know what you need. I know you don't want to talk to anybody, I'll call you tomorrow. And the next day I was fine. And one day when I called her, she said, can we just talk Monday? You just have to surround yourself with people when you do need them, they're there. Um, I think that's the answer. You'll get discouraged. You will fail. You will, it's not how many times you fall. It's how many times you get back up, right? And sometimes you can't get up and you need the person next to you. I need you to just come pick me up because I can't do it this time. If you are surrounded by a quality people, why do you go to Northwood? You go here for the quality of people that you're surrounded by, right? I met so many people today. Those are the people that will be there for you when you have that moment. Uh, so choose wisely. Thanks. One last one, then we'll call it a night. Yes. If there was, oh, it's really loud, sorry. If there was one thing that you could do differently in your past, what would it be? Um, I would have gotten better at, at not wasting my time on things that don't matter. Uh, because a lot of people told me a lot of things, I, I'm going to be a little unfair here because uh, hopefully she's asleep right now, but I'm going to say something about my mom. <laughs> um, my mom actually kind of thought you should try to be everybody's best friend and make sure, do whatever you have to do to make sure everybody loves you. My father said, the true number of people in the world that really care about you is small. Do anything for them and stop trying to please everybody on the planet. Take care of the people that matter most and don't worry about every human being on the planet. I wish I'd known that earlier because I wasted a lot of time with a lot of people in my life that I should have just, I'm, I'm being honest, I should have just got them out of my life earlier because they were negative energy, they were drains on me. But my mom's like, well, just try to make them happy. And the truth is, you don't have to be everybody's best friend, but be willing to do anything for the people that really are your best friend. For your friends and your family, do anything for them. And for a lot of people, you don't have to, you don't have to please everyone on the planet. You gotta please the people that care and you gotta please yourself. I wish I'd known that earlier because I did honestly waste time with people that later I was like, they never cared about me anyway, and they never cared about anything but themselves. We don't have the same values, and I don't know why I was trying so hard to be friends with people whose values I don't even agree with. I was doing that because society told me you should, and what you really should do is find your tribe, right? People that have your values, and be willing to do anything for them. You don't have to please everybody. You can't anyway. I just didn't know that. There was one last one. Yeah. In regard to your goal of owning an NFL team, 
What are is there a problem you're trying to solve in the NFL or the sports industry? <clears throat> Not anymore. This is my break from problem solving uh, because all of our companies were so focused. And I have spent a lot of years building companies, hiring people, trying to create jobs, and solving problems. <clears throat> this is not a company. What I told you was to build and grow a company and to get into something. This time we're doing something which you need to make time for. We're doing something we just always wanted to do. We love sports, but yes, there is a part of that. So that wasn't the start of it, but I, I, I'm just going to be really honest with you guys and answer it. Um, <clears throat> we think that sports ownership needs an upgrade. Okay. Um, here is some things we find out. There are no women in sports ownership, pretty much unless the husband died and they inherited the team. My partners are more women than men. We are bringing women into sports ownership. We will have some of the first women's owners groups. Uh, but here's the difference. These are women that actually made this money themselves. They were successful CEOs and business people. They're buying this team. No one's giving them anything. We're bringing women in. Half of my team is not white. We're bringing minorities in and creating opportunities. We are focusing on, so we're creating sports ownership opportunities for people, again, I'm going to be blatantly honest, that are not old white guys, because that's what most of sports ownership is. We'll bring women in. We'll bring moms in, right? We will bring minorities of all kinds into sport. But I'll tell you what else we're doing. We're going to focus on the relationship between sport and its athletes. Some of us were talking today about the fact that they all wind up broke because they're not counseled. Things like the injuries, we're looking at rehab technologies, uh, we're looking at safety technologies. We're creating a sister fund to a sports fund to invest in sports tech so that we can protect players, starting down at your guys' level here, starting below that. So we'll focus on player safety, we'll focus on player health, we'll focus on community involvement. Here's an example. When I was looking at that stadium in Miami, the Miami Marlins Stadium, like many sports stadiums, sits empty most of the non-football season. Why is that stadium not hosting job fairs? Why is that stadium not allowing homeless people to come where we can give them a shave and a shower, teach training courses there, let them stay overnight, help them get jobs? Why are we not using the assets to make the community better? We're going to do that. The stadium will be belong to the community. We will host job fairs. We will host training. We will bring dress for success and let people get free clothes. I found these RVs, <coughs> literally shower and shave homeless people and clean them up. <coughs> then we teach them how to interview. Then we set up jobs for them. So we do have big goals. We want to elevate sports ownership to be more responsible, more socially conscious. We want to care about things like, I said, like injuries, like policies. You know, the NFL got in a lot of trouble. I'm not talking about the kneeling thing. I'm talking about the domestic abuse, that they were just hiding it. We don't want to do any of that anymore. Sports has to be honest and open, and it has to protect people that are around it, including spouses of players or whoever it is. That's the problem we want to solve. I hope that when we're done, Sports ownership looks completely different than it did today. If we did that, then we've actually solved a problem. Thank you for asking that. <laughs>